the corona crisis dramatically changed the way we live today and will also have some impact on the way we will live in the future. In our series of weekly interviews, we will try to cover these issues and talk to decision makers and leading experts on the different impacts the corona crisis will have on technology and society. Today, it's a pleasure to talk to Helmut Budig. Um, I know Helmut Budig now for more than a year, and I always like to talk to him about these very different aspects because he has a very interesting background, a very interesting biography. He's been in the top management position in the IT sector, especially in the telecommunication industry. For more than 20 years, he worked as a journalist on technology in a leading Austrian newspaper. And today he runs his own business called Everything Media. Before covering these different issues and the different stages of his biography, let me start with a question. How is life today? You're based in Austria. How did the Corona crisis impact Austria and how did it change your daily life? Personally, it's it's fine. Uh, we have the privilege of having a small home outside of Vienna uh, next to a lake and, and uh, there is space on the terrace and a small garden. So, so it's uh, a fairly easy kind of uh, life for the exception of social contacts. And I think that's the biggest issue and the biggest concern we all have that basically we are staying confined to our to our walls that may be smaller walls, bigger walls. And of course, that is not always easy to take. So what kind of long-term effect do you expect from the Corona crisis on the way we will live and work in the future? Well, I think in some ways, uh, the crisis can be compared and has been compared to the financial crisis 2007 and 2008. Um, I think that's economically probably true, but there was a big difference. In 2007-8, we didn't have to stay home. We didn't have to work from home. Uh, we were free to move around. And so what's happening now is that we are learning in, in a super fast way how to do all these things and still be connected to people, talk to our friends, get things delivered to our homes um, and work from home. And so all these trends have been happening and I think what we'll see now is an acceleration of these trends. But I'm sure that we're sort of skipping ahead maybe five, maybe seven years in the application of all these things. You've been vice president uh, of corporate communication and responsibility uh, of T-Mobile Austria, one of the largest telecom companies in the country. What kind of challenges does the corona crisis pose to telecom companies? Now, in terms of the networks, they have to learn how to deal with the demand and the capacity that's needed. And that needs a lot of load balancing in networks. Uh, the peak capacities were needed in the evenings because video streaming definitely buries the largest load on the network. And so the peak times for video streaming so far have been between, say, 8 o'clock and midnight. And that also meant that during the daytime, you had capacities that were unused. So in a way, the daily capacities are now being used and you still have a lot of leeway uh, to do that. Did the telecom providers prepare for such a scenario in a global pandemic? I think not really. Basically, networks are built on resilience. So their DNA has to do with uh, surviving difficult situations building in redundancies. And we are also lucky that privatization many years ago brought us several networks and not just one network. So in a certain way, they have been preparing for difficult times, but nothing like we see today. I heard about South Korea and Taiwan that the IT sector allowed tracing and tracking of individuals and therefore helped to combat this coronavirus. Uh, do you have any insights how this worked? Well, there is uh, various stories going around. They identify individuals um, who have been infected and you can see where they're moving. I would say it's a, an interesting first step to use data for tracking. Israel is taking this a step further. 
Israel has announced that they will identify persons with, uh, or when they have identified persons with uh, COVID-19, they will track them and recall the persons they have been in contact with. And of course, that makes a lot of sense in, in finding who could be infected and uh, stopping the, the infection to spread. Now, the problem with Israel, I see, is this. It's done by military services. And Israel has a lot of know-how in this field, which probably only a few countries in the world have, and uh, because they have been gathering their know-how from uh, fighting terrorism, which also is a question of uh, finding out about the networks. So uh, the problem I see is that this know-how is basically not available in the civil sector. Uh, for instance, it's not available for the ECDC, the European uh, Center for Disease uh, Prevention and Control. Does this tracking just mean that a kind of artificial intelligence knows what I'm doing and reacts more on a societal level? Or does it mean that I get more information on my smartphone about my own risk? It would actually mean that you get personal information that you have been in contact with a person who has been infected. You should go home for the next 14 days. And if you have symptoms, you should call the medical services to help you. That's what it would mean. But it also means that somewhere in the background, we have all this information available to, to uh, the civil agencies, the health agencies that now handle the crisis. I think this perfectly links to the debate that you addressed with your new book entitled Spy in My Pocket. That's about personal data collection. Um, how do you, what kind of risks do you see that in the given situation, we might not take personal data protection so serious because as there is an epidemic, there's a trade-off between data privacy and health security. Uh, is there a certain risk that we now, um, that we get used to some applications that we would never accept in a non-crisis situation? We are suffering from what I call the sorcerer's apprentice uh, syndrome. Uh, we are afraid that we find some magical trick that we can use in this situation, but the magical trick will never stop. And I think in dealing with all digital developments, we need to find uh, ways where we say we can control digitization rather than digitization controlling us. So if you want to have the benefits, uh, you need to look at this very carefully because I, I'm sure that, uh, that we don't want to give up the benefits if they can actually help to prevent deaths. Um, I think it, at some point comes down to the very simple question, how many dead people does it take before we give up a certain amount of privacy? And when I say this, I'm also saying all of this needs a legal framework. What should be the components of this legal framework? How could it look like? Well, components would be A, it's civil agencies handling this and not our secret services. B, it can only be affected by parliamentary majorities and probably qualified majorities like a two-thirds majority. C, there needs to be a clear time limit. When does it stop? So, um, you know, it's something that needs to be prolonged every time you do it. It's not open for when the crisis is over. It needs to be something like, the next two weeks, the next three weeks, and then you have to come back to Parliament to get another extension. Um, uh, the, uh, I think one of the big issues is that we need to not allow accidental findings. For instance, uh, one of the things Austrians would be worried about is that their home help, uh, which is not being uh, paid for in terms of taxes, might be discovered. And so if that happens by accident, um, there should not be any consequences from this. Uh, this is something that our legal frameworks do not know. You know, once the authorities find out something, whichever way, they can use it against you. Now, we should need to limit that. That's another kind of issue here. So, so that's sort of the set of rules um, that I think we can deploy and uh, sort of Uh, make sure that the genie gets back into the bottle or that the sorcerer's apprentice is being stopped by the sorcerer itself, which is the people. 
you mentioned the technology that allows government or agencies to identify the exact location of a person. Um, how far is this technology? Can the one or two meter distance, which is now recommended, be identified by the network just saying beep, beep, bzz, bzz, don't get closer? Telecom networks by themselves would have a hard time. I think it's quite a technological challenge to, to actually do this. The first challenge is, is that we have different layers of information coming from different sources. So, for instance, in Austria, if you want to track the movement of people, you need all three major providers who run their own networks, and you put these layers on top of each other so you can actually see if person A has been in contact with person B and C, who are wearing different networks. But still, it's it's not very accurate, and the one to two meters is difficult to assume. Now, I think this is where a lot of information has to be provided by social services like Google, particularly like Google. Uh, Google has been storing users' information for the past 10 or 15 years, unless they opted out, which not a lot of people do. And that kind of information is uh, is uh, supported by GPS. It uses the network data from the telecom providers. It uses uh, Bluetooth. It uses uh, wireless LAN. So you put all that together in these layers, and then you become quite accurate. What kind of future technologies might affect the situation? I think that there is all other sorts of data that up that already is being collected on a huge scale that could eventually also support this kind of uh, putting layers together. For instance, take face recognition. Um, I'm, I'm referring now to the, the first few cases in Berlin who started from two clubs where people were in contact with each other and two infected persons at that time infected probably uh, two dozen, three dozen others. Now, I'm quite sure that in a social setting like that, a lot of pictures were posted online because people take pictures just about anywhere. Um, and these pictures would, for instance, give a clue on the proximity of persons. Uh, that the question we asked before about the one, two meter distance, a picture can tell that story. So face recognition can play a huge part in this. And even more so if public cameras, security cameras employ face recognition. And here we are really, really on thin ice. And you see any kind of additional layer when we talk about personal health data, smartwatches and so on? Well, here it becomes very private because uh, I think that smartphones have a have a, uh, an increasing role to, to play in helping us with our personal health. And I'm talking, for instance, the the very promising kind of research that goes on into early detection of Parkinson, early detection of Alzheimer, um, managing a diabetes, uh, preventing uh, heart failures. Um, there's a lot of that happening and helping us to to manage our personal health and extend lives. Now, of course, the more these kind of data happen, the more they can also link in into, um, into prevention measures. For instance, uh, you would know people who have a precondition that would make them more susceptible to the COVID, um, COVID-19 illness. So you can take extra care for them. Uh, and so on and so on. So, so I think that health data play a big role, uh, but the privacy issue becomes even more complicated. For over 20 years, you were a journalist of economics and technology in one of Austria's leading newspapers. Changing people's behavior is also a communication task. And shutting down the whole country or even whole, nearly whole Europe is also depending on the individual behavior of people. What kind of lessons did you learn from the last two weeks about communication? At this moment, we see more acceptance for a unified, authentic message that concerns our health, our public health. And of course, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it also makes sense not to do this in a 100% North Korean style. For instance, recently, the head of the Chamber of uh, Physicians was warning about the lack of uh, protective gear. 
And I think that's important that we hear these voices. What did we do right in Austria, and especially the Austrian government, that helped to change people's behavior so quickly and to build up trust in these limitations so that people accept it? What were the success factors? One goes back to the political situation. Uh, we've had a change in the uh, setup of the government between the ÖVP, the, the uh, middle of the road conservative party, and the the FPÖ, the right-wing party, um, and that broke down, uh, as we know, in Austria a year ago, and uh, almost a year ago, and it's now a green conservative coalition. And actually, the interesting thing is, while everybody was expecting them to immediately get into fights over the issue of migration, uh, they now have a chance to really establish themselves as the voice of reason and the voice of good action. Let's have a brief outlook. We already talked about how it will change, how the corona crisis might change the way we will live at home and what kind of technologies might be more important in the future. One more aspect is the resilience of systems. What can we learn from the crisis regarding the resilience of whole systems against unex unexpected shocks? I think the the recent wave or the, the, the wave of digitization that we experienced, say, over the last 10 or 15 years, um, carried as a motto, uh, break things and, uh, and you know, come out, come out quick and learn from your mistakes and so forth and so on. We need to sort of reconsider this motto of uh, break things and just do things quickly. I think we need to simply put more effort into making sure that our critical lifelines will hold up. So that's one aspect that comes out of this. Um, I think we, we also will learn how to build more redundant systems. I mean, um, our capitalistic system, and I'm not saying this as a as the big C word, you know, to be afraid of, but these systems are not really into redundancy. Um, they are more into monopolizing. Of, you know, it, the tendency is to have one huge thing doing everything, and of course that does not help resilience. For instance, if Google's search machine would break down in a situation like this, Europe had wouldn't know where to go to. I mean, there is a few alternatives, but nobody knows them. And of course, that's not helpful. So we, we need to to uh, make sure that we have backup systems and not just rely on the one important uh, system that handles everything. Mr. Spudich, thank you very much for taking the time. It's been a pleasure talking to you and all the best for the upcoming weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, same to you. Stay safe. Stay inside. Been a pleasure having this talk with you.